Uh, making a stink. Making a stink. <laughs> no, no, you'll, you'll, you'll see how it's going to come around. If you have your Bibles and you'd open them to Revelation chapter 8, and we're going to read the first six verses of Revelation chapter 8. So it's Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. And if we'd stand tonight in honor of the reading of God's Word, and I read tonight from the King James text, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayer of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And you're saying, how in the world is he going to get anything sound like making a stink out of that text? But I want us to look also tonight at Revelation chapter 5, just three verses, verses 6, 7, and 8. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts, and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Making a stink. Amen. Master, we thank you, God, for this evening. We thank you, God, for every single opportunity we ever had as a free people to come into the house of God. Lord, you place the word in my spirit for this moment in time. There will be those not only in this room that will hear it, but those that will one day hear it on the Internet, those that will hear it by tape. And God, in order to be effective, we need the anointing and the presence of the Holy Ghost to reside upon your word. God, let it go forth today and let it not come back void, but rather let it perform that which you desire in the heart of every hearer. Help us, Lord, today to be challenged and changed by the word of God that we might, with every passing moment, be more and more like you. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Amen. Twice within the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we read that the prayers of God's people rise before him as a sweet-smelling savor or as an incense. You know, it's interesting, but within the... English language, we have a lot of terms and a lot of phraseology that uses the concept of smell as it relates to uh, things that we say or things that we hear. Somebody comes to you and says something, and they'll say, well, did you hear Joe Schmo, you know, his wife left him, and blah, blah. Oh, that really stinks. Amen? Don't you say that? Oh, that stinks. That's terrible. Oh, that really stinks. You know, this person really did somebody dirty. Oh, well, that was a, what a stinking thing to do. Right? We attach, even though uh, the news of these things, and even though these kind of activities do not in reality generate an odor, yet in a figurative fashion they do. In a, in a figurative way, uh, it is so vile and so corrupt and so inappropriate and so undesirable that we actually within our mind are able to attach a smell to that conduct and attach a smell to the words that we're hearing. It's one of the interesting things about human beings, you know, how we, we can employ a sense that isn't even in use. It's not even part of the process. And yet all of a sudden it's as if our nostrils are somehow smelling something. 
somebody will say how, oh, well, so-and-so uh, bought a birthday cake that cost a million dollars for so-and-so for his birthday, and the other person will say, oh, that's sweet. Well, of course, because birthday cake is sweet, right? No, but that's not what they mean. Because in reality, what you're doing when you say that something is sweet, you're using the same exact uh, type of uh, language that you use when you say something stinks, except you're in reverse. Now you're saying it has a sweet smell. That thing has a sweet odor. That, that action has a sweetness to it. So when your senses are employed, you're sensing a sweetness about it, you see? So our language employs a lot of terms that actually speak of uh, the smell sense, even though in reality our smell sense is not part of the process. But in a figurative way, it becomes part of the process. It is frequently said that one who constantly rehashes an old dispute is stirring the pot. And you know the old saying, the more you stir, the more it will stink. The more you take a, an old circumstance or an old situation that isn't good, instead of just letting, as the old so, uh, saying goes, instead of just letting an old dead dog lie, and the more you stir it up, the more it's going to stink. Now, even though you're not smelling anything, but you're creating an atmosphere of negativity and you're creating a, an atmosphere that doesn't really hit the senses too nicely. That's what we're saying when we say that, isn't it? Okay, this then is why we are admonished to let a dead dog lie. Let it go. Leave it alone. Don't keep stirring the pot so as to revive the nasty odor of a bad situation. God's people are called today to verbalize with great positivity. We are admonished to worship the Lord with the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name in every situation. And I want to reiterate tonight, the Bible does not tell us to thank God for every situation. It says in every situation. You know, when you wind up in a hospital bed and you're about half dead, believe me, you don't want to say, well, thank you, Lord, I'm here. There's nowhere I'd rather be than right here. No. But you can say, thank you, Lord, I'm still living. I could be dead. I may, I may have to struggle for every breath. I may, you know, I may uh, be on death's door. I may be at the cusp of death, but I'm still alive. And so long as there's life, there's hope. So what the Bible is really encouraging us to do, as I preached a few weeks back, is to look for the positive, or to look for God working in every situation. What's the Lord trying to do in this? Is there something, can I see something God might be trying to do in this situation? When we went to Aunt Dorothy's and prayed with her and Uncle T about Jeff, the Lord gave me a word concerning that situation. And I said that this would, that God could turn this situation or would turn this situation into something that was basically just a bump in the road. It was just an experience, the Lord said, that Jeff is going to have to go through. It's just something he's going to have to go through. Because, here's where the good stuff comes. Because, the Lord said, I want to draw him closer to me. I want him to be closer to me than he's ever been before. And I'm going to tell you, there is nothing in this world that can cause your heart to be drawn closer to God than standing on the rivers of the Jordan River and looking across those dark waters and realizing how mortal you are and how close you are to actually realizing what your faith has been claiming. And all of a sudden, when you're on death's door, and you realize your mortality is brought to the forefront, all of a sudden you can find yourself digging a little bit deeper, not being quite so shallow in your spiritual experience, but actually digging a little bit deeper and getting a little bit more real with God about knowing Him and serving Him. And the Lord said, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm trying to do with Jeff. I'm trying to draw him closer. And the way that I can do this is by allowing him to pass through this valley 
that's going to be very difficult and very strenuous, and it's going to be a hard time. But in the process of passing through this valley, he's going to benefit because when he comes out on the other side, he's going to have a closer walk with me than he had going in. So should Jeff thank God in his situation? Absolutely. Why? Because, Lord, in this situation, you're allowing me the opportunity to draw closer to you. So if we look for the positive in every situation, I remember when I lay in the hospital and I was going through that horrific experience that I went through five years ago, I remember literally laying in that hospital bed and thinking, now, Lord, you surely cannot find anything good in all this. Lord, surely you cannot point to anything in this situation that is good and thank you for. And he said, oh, yes, I can. And I said, what? And he said, when you come out of this, you're going to have a testimony. Who glory he said, you're going to have a testimony that very few people have. He said, when you come out of this thing, you're going to have a story to tell like very few people have ever had. You're going to be able to tell people how real God is. You're going to be able to tell people how God answers prayer. You're going to be able to be a walking, talking testimony of the power and grace of God. He said, honey, believe me, when this thing's all done, you're going to look back and realize that you could thank me in this circumstance. And it was right then and there at that time that I began to thank God for it. Didn't wait till I got out of the hospital. Didn't wait till I could walk again. Didn't wait till I didn't have to use a cane to walk. No. The minute the Lord told me what his plans were and what his goals were and what he was going to do through that circumstance, immediately I was able to begin to say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. So sometimes if we'll just stop long enough to hear from God, God, what are you doing? Don't crab about why you're there. God, why am I here? Because I know you wouldn't put me here if there wasn't something good for me to get out of it. I know I wouldn't be here if there wasn't something positive to be gleaned from being here. So why have you placed me here? I'm not asking that as a rebellious child. I'm asking that so I can thank you for putting me here. I can't thank you when I don't know what you're doing. But if you'll tell me what you're doing, I'll thank you for putting me here. And that's what I did when I was sick. I couldn't thank God for my it, in the situation. But once I understood what he told me, what he was doing, immediately I was able to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. You see? The Bible calls us to thank God in, in all situations. Not to thank him for, but to thank him in looking at the positive aspect of each situation rather than focusing on the negative. I can look back a couple of weeks ago and say, well, my car, I was involved in a, a little collision in a parking lot. Yes, that's, that's a fact. But you know what? Nobody was hurt, thank God. No major damage was done. Even my car didn't sustain enough damage to make it visibly awkward to drive it around. You know, I'd be embarrassed to drive a car around that was all bashed up and banged up. Thank God the car wasn't all bashed up and banged up. Thank God the car was only damaged slightly. Thank God nobody was hurt. There's a lot to thank God for in that circumstance. But see, you'll have some people who are so negative in life that they'll focus in on the accident and forget about all the positive aspects of the situation. Amen. God's people are called to verbalize with great positivity. In in 2 Corinthians 2, verses 12 through 17, the word of the Lord says, Furthermore, when I come to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and the door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother, But taking my leave of them, I went from thence unto Macedonia. Macedonia. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. Which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. 
Boy, if we'd remember that, in every situation, in the end, God is always going to cause us to triumph. He's always going to cause us to come out the winner. I've been in courtrooms more in the last four years than I've been in court my entire life, and people have tried to do nasty, stupid, dumb things to me, and God has caused me always to triumph. Every time I leave the courtroom, I've won the case. Amen. Every time I've left the courtroom, I've won the battle. So thank God. So rather than cramming about having to go to court for this foolishness and that foolishness, I can thank God that every time I had to go, I left the victor. Praise God. Amen. Now thanks be unto God which always causeth, uh, causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. And in them that are saved, and in them that perish, to the one we are a savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So what Paul is basically saying here in a nutshell is, as believers, we are a perfume. We are an odor in the nostrils of God. Oftentimes you'll hear me refer to certain conduct within the church when God's people act a certain way and they do a certain thing. And you'll hear me say, that is a stench in the nostrils of God because that kind of conduct and that kind of behavior and that kind of communication and that kind of preaching and those kind of words are not a sweet-smelling savor in the presence of the Lord but rather it's a stench. It creates a nasty smell. A lot of times preachers get up in pulpits and they preach, and rather than a perfume rising before the Lord that pleases him, God is sitting there having to hold his nose because rather than presenting something that is smells sweet, they present something that's making a stink. Amen. You hear me now? The Bible tells us in Proverbs 18 and 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it, meaning that love life, shall eat the fruit thereof. What we allow ourselves to speak is the reality that we're going to live in. If we speak nothing but negativity and doom, then guess what? Negativity and doom will visit us every day of our lives. Our voice is born not in our throats, but in our hearts. Amen. You think your voice starts out? You think when your mouth opens and those words fly out? You think that started in your voice box? No, it started in your heart. Amen. The Bible said in Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 45, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So you see, Tommy, what we have to say starts in our heart. It doesn't start in our throat. We, we think, you know, it starts in our head and then it finds its way to the voice box and it comes out that way. You know, so in, in most people's minds, they think that communication begins head, throat, voice. But really, it starts heart, head, throat, voice. Aha! The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 15 through 16, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate forget not, for with such sacrifices God 
is well pleased. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago and how I've heard this presented and misrepresented so many times over the years. But Paul is saying to do good and to communicate. In other words, talk to the Lord about it. Don't let something good go by without saying, thank you, Jesus. Don't let something good go by without saying, thank you, Lord. Don't let something good... You know, how many times when you're in a relationship, it drives you nuts when you try to do something nice for somebody and they don't acknowledge it. And they don't say thank you. And they don't seem appreciative. And, oh, doesn't that just get up your craw? Doesn't that just tear you up when people act like that? I don't have to ask Tommy. I know his answer. But, you see, the reality is, how do you think God feels when he is up there in heaven and he has sent angels on your behalf to clear the way before you so that your foot doesn't stumble and you don't fall over the edge of a precipice? How do you think God feels when he's watching out for you and you just go through life and act like he's not even anywhere to be found? My Lord, have mercy. And you heard me say a few weeks back, that's why there are some people, maybe they go overboard, maybe they go crazy, with their praise God, thank you, Jesus, hallelujahs, you know. Maybe they go nuts with it. But you know what? It's better to go over than not to go enough. It's better to go overboard than to go under. Amen? The Word of God tells us in 1 Thessalonians five sixteen through uh, 18, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this, meaning your present circumstance and situation, is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks. Why? Because you know it's the will of God for you. God's put you there for a reason. Lord, I'm here for a reason. Whenever I'm going to get out of this, thank you for it. Whatever I'm going to get from this, thank you for it. Something good is going to come out of this mess when it's all said and done. So thank God for it. Today I ask the question, do our heavenly, heavenward communications bring honor and glory to the Lord? Do they rise before God as a sweet-smelling savor? Or do they rise before Him as a foul odor? Paul taught us, in writing to the Thessalonians that we're to pray without ceasing. That means simply that every word that comes off your lips ought to be something that we could say in front of the Lord. Amen. Everything we say ought to be something God could hear. Because He is hearing it. But the problem is, are we making a stink? Or are we allowing that prayer, are we allowing that communication to be a sweet-smelling savor before him? Uh, you know, there's a lot of times I've done little things, bang my finger with a hammer or something. And you get so aggravated and you just want to cuss and scream and holler. And do you know that I literally have thought to myself, but if I voice that, that's going to be a stench in the nostrils of God. That's not going to be pretty. That's not going to smell good. There's no, and I literally have instead turned around and said, Oh, thank you, Jesus. And somebody will hear me be in the face. They'll be like, What did you do? What happened? You get a blessing? Did you get touched by the Holy Ghost? No, I slammed my finger with a hammer. But I want what comes out of my mouth to be a sweet-smelling savor. If I can turn situations around so that I'm speaking something positive and praiseworthy, then I'm creating a perfume before the Lord. And I'm doing what God wants me to do, rather than letting all this negativity and all this harshness come out, which in turn is just creating a not-so-beautiful smell. I don't know about you, but I've smelled some perfumes that I'm not crazy about. The Bible said that, you know, that, that these incense and what have you were the prayers of the saints. That doesn't necessarily mean they all smelled good. I've smelled some incense that could make you want a wretch. I've never gone one time to a... You know, I, I went one time to a home of a Hindu family, and they were having a... They have a festival of lights every year, and this young man that I knew invited me to come over to his house, and I went... I didn't realize it was a religious uh, thing. I thought it was a cultural thing. And when I got there, I saw that they had their little 
idol and they had incense burning in front of their idol and they had offerings laid out in front of their little idol and I had to excuse myself because as a Christian I cannot participate in anything that even remotely has anything to do with idolatry and uh, so I had to excuse myself and leave but boy I'll tell you one thing I sat there for a little while and the incense they were burning was in my nostrils it stunk so bad that my stomach was churning and turning. I thought for sure I was going to vomit. But see, they, they seemed to handle it just fine. They seemed to think it was just grand. But in my senses, it didn't smell so hot. And I wonder sometimes how many times we will say things and do things, and the Lord is up there in heaven and says, Ooh, yeah. Whew. Mm. that didn't smell so good. That didn't hit me so good. Makes me wonder sometimes, seriously, if some of what we say and some of what we do, if, if we couldn't have turned it around to make it a sweet-smelling savor before the Lord instead of being a stench in the nostrils of God. The Word of God tells us in Ephesians 5, 18 through 20, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, Paul's writing to the Ephesians church that we are always to have a song in our heart. We are always to have positive things coming off of our lips. It's one of the things I love about singing the, a, a lot of these wonderful gospel songs because they have such a wonderful positive message. You know, you never hear a gospel song, Well, I hate my brother and I hate my father too. They can go to hell because I'm going to go to the zoo. You know, you don't hear stuff like that in gospel music. The message in gospel music is positive and it's uplifting. And I remember Sister uh, Gillum used to love this one song that we sang at the Riverside Church of God and it comes from scripture and the song was called Songs in the Night and the chorus simply said Songs in the Night Songs in the Night Songs in the Night When I need them my God gives us songs in the night even in the darkest times, even in the most troubled hours, God puts a song in our heart. That's how uh, Paul and Silas were able to sing after they had been beaten and after they'd been bloodied. And here they were in stocks in prison. And these men sat there and they started singing, living in the midnight, waiting for the morning, looking for the day. When he splits the sky, I've lived through the darkness. I'm looking for the sunshine, living in the midnight, oh, but soon the sun will rise. And you know the story. The prisons were shaken by an earthquake and the shackles fell off. And Paul and Silas were able in that circumstance. God, why did you put me here? Because there's a jailer that needs to be saved. There's a jailer that needs to see a miracle. He needs to see the power of God. And I need you here for the moment. Well, that's okay, Lord. If that means we have to be beaten, if that means we have to be bloodied for the time being, it'll be all right because about 1 o'clock this morning, we're going to baptize the jailer and his whole household in Jesus' name to the glory of God. So it's worth the now for the later. Amen. So see, God had a great purpose to work out. And that's why Paul and Silas had to endure that, that short span of difficulty, because God had something great planned. He said, I've got a Philippian jailer. When he walks into your cell and sees that you're still there, when you could have split the minute that door swung open with that earthquake, and when he sees that you're still there, he's going to be ready to kill himself, he'll be so upset, and y'all are going to be able to tell him, listen, there's still hope, it's in Jesus, and that jailer is going to say, what do I have to do to be saved, and you'll be able to tell him, amen, in Colossians 3, 15 through 17, the word of God reads, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, 
In the rich also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Again, I have to point out just because I like to do this, so y you all are reminded. But if you look at the language here, it looks like Paul's speaking of two different people, giving thanks to God and the Father. And we know that, there, that God and the Father are not two different people, but it sounds like that because of the language. But the word and in the Greek also translates even. Therefore, Paul was simply saying, giving thanks to God, even the Father, by him. We are always to train our tongues to manufacture perfumes and not obnoxious gases. Our mouths should be warehouses of praise and thanksgiving and not merely storehouses for cursing and complaints. James chapter 3, verses 3 through 12, and I'm closing. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little, a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed by, of mankind. We've got whales that are tamed and perform in aquariums. We've got dolphins that perform. We've got seals and sea lions that perform. We've got elephants that perform. We've got lions that perform. We're able to tame all these wild beasts, some of them being way greater in mass than any human beings. And yet, <laughs> but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. See, this is what we're wanting to do. We don't want to release that poison because as a child of God, it immediately, any communication comes out of our mouth, goes straight to God's ears. And unfortunately, to get to God's ears, just like you and I, it's got to pass his nose. Amen. So when the communication comes out of our mouth, if it isn't so sweet, then the Lord's sitting there going, Woo, <laughs> Woo God is having a bad day today, out there. Woo, check shirt is, woo, boy, I'll tell you, he needs to, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it goes on to say, therewith, bless we God, even the Father. Now, do you see how in this case he used the proper, the King James actually uses the proper translation. It's the same exact word, Kai. It's the same exact word, but they actually use the correct term. Here they use even instead of and. He says, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. One thing that I hate is when I hear a preacher get up in the pulpit and say, these things cannot be. That's not what Paul said. There's a huge difference between what is possible and what should or should not be. Paul is saying this ought not to be. He said, folks, we shouldn't be doing this. It's not that you can't be a Christian and do it, because you can. He said, but you shouldn't. You follow what I'm saying? It's, and a lot of preachers, I've heard all my life, I've heard preachers get up and talk like, these things can't be. You can't be a Christian and talk like this. You can't be a Christian and do this. You can't be a Christian. No, that's not what Paul said. He said you shouldn't be a Christian and do this, or you shouldn't be a Christian and act like that, or you shouldn't be a Christian and talk like that. But he didn't say you couldn't. 
So it's not an either-or proposition. And I do despise when it's presented as though it's an either-or proposition, because that makes people who maybe let their flesh get ahead of them more often than not, makes them feel like they're not a Christian because they do that. And that's not what Paul was saying, not by any stretch of the imagination. But he does go on to say, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. So what Paul's trying to tell us here is we need to dig our well so that we know the source. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And Paul says, therefore, let that one source be your source. Let the Lord be your source. Don't, don't let the Lord be your source sometimes, and then let anger and bitterness and malice be the source other times. He said, no, you've got to let one source You've got one fountain that comes out of you, so let the same source always be the same source for all of your communication. Not just some of it, not just part of it, but for all of it. So even when something bad happens, even when something nasty happens, let, let that same source that you sing songs in the night, let that same source be the source that helps you to respond to the negative and the nasty and the bad. So that this way, instead of making a state, all of our communication consistently is offered before the Lord as a perfume and as a sweet-smelling savor. Amen. Is that all right? Get something out of that? Okay. If you'd stand with me tonight. It's just ten after seven, so we made good time. Okay. <laughs> Master, we thank you, God, for this evening. We thank you for this word. We ask, God, that you would help us, Lord, to take it with us. Lord, that it might bear fruit in our lives and bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. Help us, Lord, in every communication, every word that comes out of our mouth. Help us, God, to be mindful that our source is you. Our source is the hope and the joy and the peace and the grace that you've brought into our lives. And help us, Lord, always to tap into that source for every reaction, to every situation, to every single uh, event that comes into our lives, everything that comes our way. God, help us this hour, we pray, that every communication that comes from our lips might rise up before you as a sweet-smelling savor and as a perfume, as something pleasant, so that even in the most horrific of circumstances, Lord, you're able to look down and say, Oh, that smelled nice. Did you see how Donna reacted to that? Wasn't that beautiful? Did you see how Charles reacted? Did you see how Tommy reacted to that circumstance and that situation? What a beautiful thing. That sure was sweet. Master, help us, we pray this day, because God, surely the tongue is a difficult thing to tame, and every one of us, God, needs your help. And we just ask God today that you would just help us and give us strength today that we might bring you glory and honor in everything we say and do. For we do it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you tonight, and amen.